Okay, so welcome back to the Queens of the Damned, a horror podcast, and we are going to be talking about Final Girls today. For an introduction, um, we got another patron, so we really wanted to thank him. We weren't expecting patrons to start coming in so quickly. Uh, his name is Scott, so thank you, Scott, for contributing to us. We uh, also got a really, really sweet message from him that I wanted to read because it's one of the best reviews we've had so far. So he said, I love your podcast. It's in the same vein as my two favorites, the last podcast on the left and my favorite murder. I also listen to various Stephen King podcasts. So this podcast is like the perfect combo of it all and more horror and oriented, which I absolutely love. QOTD is the first podcast I've actually become a patron of because I, I saw you only had a single patron and I did not want to see your podcast go away. And beans and weenies isn't a great <laughs> diet. Don't worry, Scott, we just launched our Patreon. So <laughs> I love that you all seem to fit in the king at least once an episode i've just recently finished a complete chronological reread of all of his work up to gwendy's button that box is so i oh know my gosh. he co-wrote with richard uh chismar of cemetery dance mm -hmm. anyway keep up that the was so good keep up the awesome work ladies also a shout out to darkness dave and tim on the beyond the darkness podcast another fave that's another one i didn't know about so thanks again scott Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, we wanted to start the episode out with kind of a recap of, like, the history of Final Girls and, and actually the origin of the term and everything. So Rachel Rachel has the book on it, so she is going to <laughs> give us – she's going to start out with that. Okay, so um... – the term Final Girl was coined by uh, Carol J. Clover. Uh, she's an author. I think she is a professor. She is. She's a professor of film studies at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so she wrote this nonfiction book called Men, Women, and Chainsaws, Gender in the Modern Horror Film, which I actually read for a college class, and it's really great. Highly recommend it. But she is the first one who came up with the concept of the final girl for this book. Uh, so basically, the final girl fits into a series of tropes. So in a slasher movie, which is mostly where the final girl shows up, you have a killer and he kills off the victims one by one. And at the end, there's always one survivor and usually it's a female sometimes a final girl can be a male um, but generally it's a female most final girls share certain characteristics um, they're usually a virgin or at least you don't see them having sex throughout the movie uh, they usually don't drink they don't do drugs they are the most responsible character in the movie they're the ones that are fulfilling their obligations, uh, that kind of thing. They, they don't slack off. Um, a lot of the time they have a unisex name, like Avery or Chris. Occasionally the final girl has a shared history with the killer in some way. And so the basic premise of the final girl is that the audience needs a way to invest in the movie. So... In order to basically, in order to make sure that men invest in this female character surviving, she has to be masculinized a little bit, usually by taking up a weapon like a knife that has kind of more of a phallic shape to it. But that helps men identify with her, usually by showing her in terror which it usually does, that helps men feel sorry for her, at which point they are rooting for her to survive and take the killer down. And she usually does. She usually does take the killer down at the end. And in the end, if she survives, uh, which she usually does, she's generally purged of undesirable characteristics. So she's like fucked up at the end of the movie. A lot of the time, if there is a sequel, you see the final girl and she's in a mental institution or she's become a hermit. 
and she doesn't trust anybody anymore. And so it just helps her make her more pure in the end. So that's kind of the concept of the final girl. Obviously, there's a lot of variation in that. Not every final girl fits those tropes, but most of them fit at least some of those tropes, if not all of them. Yeah, that's true, because as you were going through and talking about Mm -hmm. really the the criteria of a final girl, I was going through our conversation last week about Scream and how it does and does not apply to um, Sydney as a final girl, and I'm thinking about the one that I'm going to talk about today and how... It diverges and also kind of lines up with what you were saying. I can't wait to read that book. And this book, I mean, this book was written in 1992. So obviously as society and filmmakers became more conscious of the final girl trope, you get more characters where people try to avoid some of those characteristics. Uh, Nikki, I know who you chose, and they have a unisex name. That's what I was thinking. I was going... (laughs) Yeah, and (laughs) Sydney from Scream, she has a unisex name. Mm -hmm. And so you do see, I mean, how they still end up fitting aspects of the trope. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm really rooting for my final girl. She doesn't have a unisex name. She doesn't, and neither does mine. (laughs) Neither does the one that I chose. But the, the one I almost chose does have a unisex name. So there you go. Actually, <laughs> technically mine could, but it's an old-fashioned men's name, so you don't hear it very often. Oh, I was just thinking about how you were saying the, or how she was saying that the um, the final girl concept is to keep men interested in the movie. And I was really thinking about the aspects of the final girl that also keep, even though that's not the intention, keep women interested in the movie because they've never seen a capable woman in a horror movie. So that's also like, even before the term was coined and everything, and before the book was written on it, how like, it still kind of empowered women in some way, because they, even in other movies, outside of the horror genre, don't see or didn't see women in roles of power or, or even overcoming adversity. Yeah, that's, that's like, really awesome. (laughs) Definitely. And she does, she does bring that up in the book. She does discuss that how, you know, horror gets a lot of credit for being kind of at the forefront of having female, you know, the female character that makes it till the end of the movie and is the hero of the movie. Yeah, that's great. And also horror is one of the genres that is most problematic with its treatment of females. So it's really kind of a double edged sword where you're like, there's some mm-hmm. really great things. It is. Some really, it is. Really, really yeah. awful things. And we're still experiencing those things. Although I do think directors are becoming more and more aware of it and really using horror films oh, as yeah. a societal commentary. So yeah, I can't wait to read that book. Like I said, I just I think it's going to be mm-hmm. awesome. So. It's really good. It's really good. I read it for a class about gender in film. Mm-hmm. It was very interesting. Um, so I'm going to start start off our conversation today. I actually was really bad and I didn't look at the year that this film was made, which we should probably be examining after what Rachel said. Uh, but I did Aaron from your next. As Rachel said, she <laughs> she has a unisex name. I think it was like 2006 mm-hmm. that it, the movie was made, but I can't remember exactly. So I'll give you like a a basic overview of the film. I'm really trying to walk the line between telling you every single thing that happens and like just giving you some major points that tell you things about the character. So we'll see where I wind up there. But there are no guarantees that I will not give you major spoilers. So just be warned about that because I don't know what I'm going to say. So (laughs) this movie starts with a couple. They've probably only been dating for three months. And one of them is Aaron. I don't remember the boyfriend's name. I don't remember anyone's name in this movie besides Aaron's. So it doesn't matter. I know they really don't matter. But (laughs) so I'll just be referring to them as the boyfriend, the mom, the dad. So um, they're going to visit his parents and they're kind of like a a really well to do family. And they're out in this, of course, remote house. And it's this is like a home invasion movie. Basically, the family is all sitting at dinner and it's the three brothers, the mom, the dad, and then the spouses and girlfriends of the brothers. And 
they're sitting there having dinner, and <laughs> there's some noticeable family tension going on, and they're in the middle of this argument about really nothing, and all of a sudden, someone shoots a crossbow through the window and kills someone, <laughs> and that's when everybody <laughs> just <Damn. laughs> rises from the table and is tra- like, they, no one's no one's prepared for this whatsoever, except our main girl. And you don't find out why until later. And so everyone's trying to get away and they're all like huddled together. And there's maybe, oh God, 10 of them. So it's like a rather large group of people to have in this sort of movie. Usually it's about a group of like five to six, but we're looking at like 10 to 11 people who are, you know, just chaotically trying to get their shit together and figure out what to do. And so they know there's a guy outside with a crossbow. And so they say, look... Maybe one of these girls can run outside at full speed and run because they know there's a neighbor. And so she tries to, they open the door and they run her out at full speed, but someone has strung garrote wire (laughs) uh, at the door. So it slits her throat, which is not a thing that will happen, by the way. Not even true, but they play it very convincingly (laughs) in the movie. And you notice that everyone is panicking and Erin is quietly instructing people she doesn't this whole family she doesn't know like imagine you go to meet your boyfriend's parents she's quietly instructing these people she doesn't know giving them uh medical aid telling them what to do telling them to calm down and while everyone is freaking out that this girl's throat has been slit she's locking all the doors and windows and she's trying to text 911 which is a thing you can do i guess i didn't know that yeah i didn't know that either You're just kind of, like, keeping your eye on her the whole time, going, hmm, this girl's really savvy. And everyone, you really going are going back and forth between all the stories of the people in the house. So you forget about Aaron at first for a little bit, but then more and more things keep happening, where every single time something happens, she handles the situation perfectly. And finally, the boyfriend looks at her and says, I've never seen you act like this before what's up and she goes i don't know i she some bullshit answer or whatever she's like i'm just taking precautions or whatever um at one point she tells them that running into the basement is a bad idea because these people could just pour gas down the stairs and throw in a match and so she kind of interrupts the narrative where like things are supposed to go a certain way for the perpetrators of this crime. And she is doing exactly the opposite of what they expect the entire time. So it's really fun to watch what they do when their plan doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So I'm going to be telling you guys the twist here. So I might as well just tell you that two of the brothers have hired three ex-black ops guys to kill the parents so that they can get the money. They can have an inheritance. Um, And so these guys are supposed to be, like, really, really efficient killers. They're supposed to be, like, when they want someone dead, they're dead. But they are trying to make this look like a home invasion and not like, you know... They hired assassins to kill the family because obviously if the cops aren't dumb, they're going to know that. Once you know this, you are starting to admire Erin even more because she doesn't even waste her energy beating the shit out of one of these people, like in close hand-to-hand combat. She tries, once she kills him, she holds his head up and she says, does anyone in the room know this guy? Because at this point, she has no idea what's going on here. And she's trying to figure out what's going mm-hmm. on. And, like, in your panic, in the, the average person wouldn't do that. But she's absolutely doing every single thing correctly. Then we finally figure out why she's so good at doing all this. And it's not because she listens to a bunch of true crime podcasts. Um, it's because <laughs> she grew up in a survivalist compound in Australia. Um, her father... I think thought the world was going to end or something and she was the only child and so she was taught all these handy skills and methods of self-defense in a in a moment of panic all those skills just kick in 
she's confiding this to one of the girlfriends of the women, or, uh, sorry, of the men that she's clearly the mastermind behind this plot. And she's not, she doesn't have any reserves about actually killing people herself if she has to. So she's going, oh God, now this is a challenge. Like, there's the the only other female that really matters in this movie is the sort of femme fatale type um, who is the brains behind the operation. And now she's going, okay, I know this woman has all these skills. So how am I going to overcome that? So once the plan starts not going as they thought, it's now an opportunity for any of the members of the family to commit heinous murder without any repercussions because there's already people like there who are supposed to be killing people. So the evidence is all messed up. But they're not prepared for what Erin can do even when she's gravely injured, which someone comes into the bedroom. One of the SWAT, it's not SWAT guys, sorry, the ex-Black Op guys. He comes into the bedroom and there's no other um, escape route. So she just jumps out the fucking window. Damn. Like, she jumps through the window. <laughs> like, she doesn't open the oh window and jump out of it. She jumps through the fucking window and rolls onto the lawn. And, well, when she does, there's this <laughs> maybe eight-inch piece of glass that got stuck in her leg, like, really deep uh. in there. So she makes a tourniquet and everything. But she's limping around the rest of the film, but you're not even scared for her. <laughs> like, um, mm-hmm. I don't want to tell you, like, a bunch of cool stuff that happens at the end of this, but it's just more of the same of Aaron just, just kicking ass. And finally, the boyfriend comes in the house, she's the only one left. And he sees her covered in blood with a knife in her hand, and she knows what's up at this point. And he's saying, oh, you were never meant to be killed, this was not part of the plan, and, you know. He he then tries to blame her for being so good. Um, He says, how were we supposed to know that you were really good at killing people? Which is really weird, (laughs) by the way. If you'd reacted normally to this then they wouldn't have gone after you. And at that point, you're just like, you need to kill that motherfucker. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) I think really this film is kind of like porn for women who really just want to feel confident in the world. It's like she doesn't hesitate. She doesn't care about people's feelings when she's in danger. She does all the right things. She overcomes pain. She overcomes people, you know, blaming her for surviving. And it's just, like, an amazing thing to watch. I really love what they did with it, so. It's really good. It's such a good movie. Uh, I love it so much. And um, it's not what I was expecting to see when I sat down to watch another home invasion movie. So kudos to that being something that actually stood out amidst the, you know, plethora of home invasion films that are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really good. I, I, I saw it, like around the time that it came out and i was i was like you i mean i had no idea i was just like oh this horror movie got really good reviews i'm gonna watch it and then at the end i was like oh my god what a badass yeah. <laughs> like i was so into it yeah it's just everything she does is so smart and you just think you know if you were in that situation and your adrenaline was something like how how would you think mm-hmm. that clearly How would you be able to carefully Mm -hmm. look around you and assess the object that is going to kill the person that is assaulting you? Especially if that person was in the black ops. Like, those guys are brutal. (laughs) That's that's crazy. And that's the one thing about this movie that sometimes it's hard to suspend my disbelief that these guys uh, fuck up so badly. Um, I guess it. I, I kind of chalk it up to them, like not being used to not killing people quickly and efficiently um, and trying to make it sort of look like a different thing that happened. Um, And they probably aren't used to people with any set of skills to use against them. I I don't know, though, because I'm not exactly sure what what they do. I just know, like, when I hear Black Ops, I'm like, wow. (laughs) Okay. So these guys know how to, like, fuck people up. Yeah. Well, and I like that they try whether it's realistic or not but that they provide a reason that Aaron is so good at this kind of thing because like you said you think about what would I do if the adrenaline was kicking and someone was trying to murder me well I don't have the kind of upbringing that she had so there's no way that I would be able to defend myself in the way that she does 
but they at least try and make it seem like, okay, maybe it's realistic that she does have all these skills and she would be able to stay calm. I mean, at least they provide a backstory and she's just not like this superhero type character who's just killing people left and right for no reason. Yeah. (laughs) One thing they did say, and they there's like a feature on the DVD um, that I rec- I would recommend that you watch because it's really interesting to see what the director like intended for the film, is that there's supposed mm-hmm. to be a lot of black comedy in this, and I didn't catch it. I suppose like there's a couple moments I could consider funny, but most of the time I'm just like so enthralled in what's happening. I'm not like there's not a lot of dialogue mm-hmm. in the movie, and I'm not. I don't know. I didn't catch the humor part of it. I didn't either. There were parts that I laughed at that were really clever. Like, (laughs) there's this one uh, part, which probably is my favorite, where um, she's expecting the guy to crawl through the window. So she nails a bunch of nails into two boards and she sets them by the window. And so the, you know, the board's flat and the pointy ends of the nails are sticking out of it well when the guy walks through the window he sees the board with nails on it and he's like okay yeah they're really really shitty at what they're doing and so he sees the he thought okay i saw the board so he climbs through the window and steps down and there's another board there and his foot goes Mm -hmm. uh, the nail goes right through his foot and it's so just through his foot through sorry through his foot through his shoe through his bone like you can hear it it's amazing yeah (laughs) Yeah, the the kills in this I thought were pretty clever. Like you said, I mean, like with the garrote wire, like that's never going to happen in real life. But the way that it's done was neat. It was really convinced. Like it, I was able to yeah. suspend my disbelief for this movie. A, a lot of the things that happened, I was like, uh, whatever. That probably couldn't happen when I thought about it a lot. But while you're experiencing it, you... I, I think with any, especially like slasher movie, you have to suspend your disbelief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. just have to accept that these things are happening because they're happening. <laughs> and you just have to go with it. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, that's that's all I, ha- I have to say, at least. Good choice. Yeah. Have you seen that's it, awesome. Miranda? Did you get it? I haven't. Okay. I was actually, today, I was so on top of it, and I was about to watch it, and I couldn't get it to play. Like, oh, man, it kept sucks. buffering. I have and it. And I was so pissed. So if you want to borrow it, you can. But yeah, I do want to borrow it. Yeah, definitely. It's you'll really like it. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was sitting there and I was about to, it was about to like start like we thought it was actually going to play and my dad walks in and he's like, "Oh, I've seen this. It's one of the kids that's doing it." And I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" <laughs> oh my god, no. I literally like jumped up. I was like, "Are you joking?" And he was like, "Oh my god, I thought you saw it." I was like, "No. What why would you do that?" Yeah. So I had the ending ruined anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, good choice. Yeah. Um, so who's next? Um, I think I'm next. So I picked kind of the... She's probably not the first final girl, but she is the first famous final girl. So I picked Lori from Halloween. Um, Hall- <laughs> yeah. Hall- Halloween is my favorite horror movie franchise. Hands down. I've seen all of them a million times. And are they all good? God, no. But I've seen them all. Halloween (laughs) 3. Oh, my God. I can live with Halloween 3. Halloween 6. Oh, my God. I cannot live with Halloween 3. It's so bad. It is bad. But to me, Halloween 6 is worse. But in any case, yeah, I mean, I have, like, the 25th anniversary Blu-ray giant DVD box set that they came out with. uh, I love it. I love it. So, um, Lori first appeared, obviously, in the first Halloween film. So, oh, and just to be clear, I'm only going to be talking about Lori from the original franchise. I'm not including the Rob Zombie version because I don't think that he understood that Lori is supposed to be the main character and not Mm -hmm. Michael Myers. And also the girl that played her was super fucking obnoxious and really could not act. And some of it was the writing. Some of it was the writing, but some of it was her. So in any case, so uh, Lori first appears in the first Halloween movie, which comes out in 1978. I'm not going to go through a whole summary of the movie because I'm just going to assume that 99% of people have probably seen it, at least on TV. I mean, I know that like at Halloween, I think like AMC plays all the movies like one right after the other. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, which is what I when I had cable, it's what I used to do on Halloween was just lay there and watch 
the Halloween movie marathon. But in any case, Lori definitely exemplifies a lot of the final girl trope, especially in the first movie. She is the only responsible one. Her two friends basically get out of babysitting so that they can have sex with their boyfriends. Lori not only takes on their babysitting duties, but continues to perform her babysitting duties. Um, She doesn't have sex. At one point near the beginning of the movie, she does smoke pot in a car with her friend, but she's the one that's panicking about getting caught when they run into the friend's dad, who's like the sheriff in town. So she's, she's virginal. She's virtuous. She's responsible. She has a vaguely unisex name. I'm thinking of Lori from little women. (laughs) He was a boy. Um, but I guess Lori was his last name. So, or Lawrence was his last name. So I guess it doesn't really count, but in any case, Yeah, so Lori, though, is able to also improvise weapons, which is one thing that I always liked about the original movie is that she's not the damsel in distress. I mean, she does not obviously rise to an Aaron level of defending herself, but she behaves in what I would consider a realistic way. I mean, she's babysitting these two little kids, She hides the kids first, and then she does what she can to try and defend herself. I mean, she fights back with a knitting needle. She fights back with um, a hanger. She's smart enough to open the patio door so that Michael will think she went outside while she goes and hides in the closet. And in the end, she I would say she, I mean... People give Dr. Loomis credit because he shoots Michael and pushes him out the window. I know. Thank you. Nikki just made an incredulous face, and I agree. (laughs) It, Yeah, I mean, she is the one who defeats him. I mean, she rips his mask off, which terrifies him Mm -hmm. and kind of stuns him and, and makes him, you know, immobile for a few minutes. And Loomis also doesn't even kill him. Well, exactly, like, like, exactly. He doesn't exactly. even die, so... Exactly. So this is... So Halloween is one of the slasher movies where the killer is seemingly human, but then for whatever reason has these, like, superhuman qualities. I mean, he's stabbed. I think she stabs him in the eye at one point. Um, she stabs him with his own knife. She stabs him with a wire hanger. Like I said, a knitting needle. He's shot multiple times. And then still comes back for the sequel. So in the sequel, she's more incapacitated, unfortunately. Um, So the sequel takes place immediately after the end of the first movie. She is drugged up. She's in the hospital. You know, she's she doesn't really know what's going on. She's freaking out, of course. She does end up fulfilling more characteristics of the final girl trope in that one, in that her horrible experience has made her even more virtuous. Now she can't even defend herself. Now she's messed up forever and that kind of thing. The The sequel is not as good, but still good. I, I still enjoy it. But to me, what really makes Lori my favorite final girl is Halloween H2O, which was made for the 20th anniversary of Halloween. Lori basically has become a completely different person. She is an alcoholic. She, I think, is having an affair. She's, like, struggling to raise her teenage son. She has... She's legitimately messed up from what happened to her. But she breaks the trope because she's not perfect. I mean, she's got a lot of issues. And in Halloween H2O, she really does fight back. I mean, she is just not going to let this happen again, basically. Mm -hmm. She's over it. She's ready to move on with her life. She's ready to get Michael out of her life once and for all. And so at the end of H2O, he gets trapped between, I think it's like a fallen tree, like two fallen trees or something, and she beheads him. Mm -hmm. And if there were a god, that's where the franchise would have ended, but there's not, so... (laughs) (laughs) It would have ended with her killing him, as it should have ended. There is one final movie that she's in. That's Halloween Resurrection. That's the next movie. 
So at this point in the franchise, Jamie Lee Curtis, who of course plays Laurie, has realized that they are never going to kill Michael Myers ever. And so she, I saw her on Oprah once where she talked about it. She was like, I'm, I'm too old to keep doing this. And she's like, you know, Halloween will always be special to me. It will always feel like my holiday. But I just, I had to be done. So she asked them to kill her off, which they do. Um, it's kind of a shitty ending for someone who's transformed as such a badass character throughout um, the franchise. But Michael Myers kills her um, on the roof of the mental institution that she's in. And throws her off the roof. And that's the end of her character arc. That's lame. So underwhelming. Yeah. I mean, it's a lame ending for her. I mean, I feel, I mean, I understand that she wanted to leave and I don't begrudge her that, but I feel like they could have found a better way to kill her off. Yeah, I agree. As yeah. I was saying to Miranda, this is a movie that ends with Michael Myers being defeated by Buster Rhymes drop kicking him through a door. Like, this is a shit movie, and it's a terrible ending to the franchise, because, of course, after this movie, then, they just rebooted it with Rob Zombie. That was the end of the original Halloween franchise. Apparently, there's a new one coming out that I think is a going back to the original continuity, but I don't know. It's not a remake. It's supposedly a sequel. You're talking about the one John Carpenter is doing, right? Yeah, and it's going. It's pretending the Rob Zombie movies never happened. Yeah. It's going back to like the original continuity, which is already right, kind of screwed right. up. But yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Lori is definitely, and she is cited in Men, Women, and Chainsaws as being kind of the first final girl. I mean, she is sort of the genesis for a lot of the tropes that come up with the, with the final girl character. Uh, But again, I don't think she's, I don't think that makes her a weak character just because she's a traditional final girl. I mean, she does fight back. She doesn't just lose her mind and hide, which is probably what I would do. Um, She tries to outsmart him. She she improvises weapons. And and I think that her being like a goody two shoes is even an inter- even that's an interesting character trait. I mean she her big thing for why she doesn't have a boyfriend is that boys think she's too smart. And so they don't want to date her. Isn't that relatable though? It is. That's what I mean. I don't think I don't think that's a flaw. I don't think that saying, oh, well, she's this virginal, boring character. It, it's pretty realistic. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she's kind of a nerd. And her friends are clearly, like, way cooler than her. And she's just afraid to talk to guys because they think that she's too, too smart. Too smart for them. Mm-hmm. So... That's my choice. And she's played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who, of course, is the daughter of one of the first Scream Queens, at least for one role. Mm-hmm. And she actually said that playing Lori, she felt like it brought her closer to her mom mm-hmm. because she finally understood what her mom had gone through filming Psycho. That's yeah. so awesome. So, and I just love, like, I know last week we talked about Laurie Metcalf and how I feel like she can do no wrong. And that's how I feel about Jamie Lee Curtis. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just love her. And this movie did kind of catapult her into the Scream Queen territory. She did The Fog. She did Prom Night. She did a couple of other horror movies. And then, of course, she was in the show Scream Queens, Mm -hmm. which the first season, anyway, I thought was hysterical it was mean though like if you don't like mean humor it's not for you (laughs) these were not nice girls but i i mean i laughed and then felt really bad about it (laughs) isn't emma robertson in that show oh my god she's great on that show i mean she's perfect for she's amazing (laughs) yeah and i'm not a fan of her it's not acting she's a but she's amazing in that part she's amazing but yes she is she's she plays 
Chanel. She's the leader of the sorority house. Of course she is. I mean, she's she does one role, so <laughs> I was yeah. more impressed with her in Freak Show than I was with her in anything else. It's mean humor. I mean, it's bitchy mm-hmm. humor. And if you don't like that, then you won't like that show. But Jamie Lee Curtis plays the dean of the college, <laughs> and it's kind of fun because... That's really cool. You know, she's, of course, great and super campy in it. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I just love her. That's so that's awesome. my choice. That's my choice. The The first final girl, the classic. Mm-hmm. My other choice that I had mentioned in the beginning, I almost did Ripley from Alien. But because that movie follows more sci-fi tropes than horror tropes, she does not really fit the mold of the final girl at all. Mm-hmm. She just happens to be the last one standing, who's a woman and who's a badass. I think it still would be. A good choice, Um, because my professor and I were talking about, you know, he's the sci-fi guy and I'm the horror person. And we talked just talked about the the similarities between, you know, how sci-fi and horror often just intermingle a little bit. And um, I think it it definitely would have been a valid choice and like a really interesting choice, too. But you got to talk about the classic stuff. You just have to. She gets an honor an honorable mention because she's such a she. Ass. She is. I would call her. Yeah, I would call her an honorable mention. Final mm-hmm. girl. Yeah, I mean, she, I mean, she. <laughs> she's the last one standing, but not for any like trope based reasons. I mean that they don't. You don't know anything about her personal life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She's just this uh, person on a spaceship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I read an article once that she was originally written as a man. Someone tell me if I'm wrong. Someone on the internet tell me if I'm wrong. But I thought that Ripley was originally written as a male or at least a gender neutral character where it could have been played by either a man or a woman. So even there, I feel like she almost wouldn't fit because, I mean, the final girl, the point is that you're a girl. (laughs) Almost always. Like I said, occasionally there are men that fit the final girl trope, but they're extremely few and far between. Yeah. I wanted to ask, are there any movies that people can think of um, where, and this may defeat the purpose, but where there are two plus final girls? Um, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to think. I, not in one movie that I can think of, but I can think, but obviously there are franchises like, mm-hmm. um. I was going to say Nightmare on Elm Street has three different final girls. And I was about to say Friday the 13th yeah. has has a different final girl in every movie, pretty much. Hmm. Yeah. But I can't think of one where there are more, where there's more than one at the end of one movie. Yeah, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but now I'm going to be on the lookout for them. Mm-hmm. I was about to say, I'm going to start Googling now. See, if yeah. anyone actually can think of movies where, where books... I suppose that would count. Um, where there are more than one final girl, mm-hmm. let us know. Yeah, if you can think of one, please tell us. Please tell us, because I can't think of anything. And and final girls are harder to find in novels, just because it's easier in a novel, I guess, to make a three-dimensional character. I mean, you can make your book as long as you want. You know, in a movie, you have kind of this limited space to tell a story so that's my pick Lori, the og <laughs> yeah she's great such a good pick yeah she's she's my favorite and i would say that mm-hmm. the one miranda's about to do is my second favorite so good choice miranda in Thanks. advance <laughs> okay so i guess i'll just go into mine so my favorite final girl is nancy thompson from the nightmare on elm street franchise yeah i love her with all my heart (laughs) she is awesome she's such a badass okay so she is played by heather langenkamp and she was a teenager when she for the first movie she was a teenager at the time and when she interviewed wes craven was just just loved her and he saw a lot of Nancy just in her personality. So she was kind of already embodying this character just right out of the forefront. So she's the leading lady in the first movie, the third movie, and the seventh movie. In the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, we have three different final girls, but Nancy is 
the best of them all. I love all the movies, but Nancy really kicks ass and she really like gets the ball rolling in everything. Throughout the whole series, she takes absolutely no shit ever from anybody. She's always standing up for herself. It doesn't matter who's talking to her. She gives attitude right back to her parents if they give it to her. She really just doesn't care. She kicks ass and she believes in herself even when other people don't. She doesn't really care what other people think. When she sees reality one way, she just figures, well, it doesn't really matter what you guys think because this is the way I see it, so it is what it is. And I love that. So, The First Nightmare on Elm Street came out in 1984, and Nancy's mother is an alcoholic, and her dad is a cop, and I do believe they're divorced. They never actually say that they are, but you never see them in the same house together, so it's kind of implied. So Nancy, what I gather from all this, she's kind of forced to take a lot of the adult responsibility. It kind of feels like she's had to do some of the work in raising herself, and so she's become very self-sufficient and independent. And she also is not afraid to confront her mother about her past and things that she had done in the past. And she very blatantly comments on her mother's alcoholism quite a few times in the movie. She also takes problems into her own hands, despite the what I okay, what I love in this series is that the men are just completely fucking useless. Like actually oh, they yeah. just they just get in the way the whole time. So despite, you know, her trying to get help from the people in her life. She still takes, you know, she still solves the problems. She takes everything into her own hands. You know, her boyfriend, Glenn, falls asleep when he's supposed to be watching her. And her dad is a cop, but he really is absolutely no help because he can't catch Freddy Krueger. And he doesn't believe her either. Nobody believes her. Um, She also confronts Freddy alone at the end of the movie. And she actually says to him, I know you're there, Krueger. I know you too well now, Freddy. It's too late. I know the secret now. This is just a dream, too. You're not alive. The whole thing is a dream. I want my mother and my friends again. And she just walks away. And now she didn't necessarily kill Freddy. She actually is still in a dream at the end of the movie. But the fact that she's able to kind of confront Freddy on her own was something that I really loved because she does it after her father walks out of the room. And so she just doesn't need any more assistance. Um, And she also just watched her mom die, and she's still just like, you know, fuck you, Freddy, I don't care. So then Nightmare on Elm Street 2 happens, and that's just, I don't even know. Um, (laughs) I love it. (laughs) The third movie comes out, which is Dream Warriors, comes out in 1987, and I love Dream Warriors. It's arguably, I think, more popular than the first movie. People love Dream Warriors. And Nancy is back, and she is 22, so she's no longer a teenager. Rather than kind of coming back a little... Rachel, you you mentioned that the final girls, when they come back in the sequel, they're, like, kind of messed up. There's something wrong with them. This mm-hmm. isn't the case for Nancy at all. She comes back even stronger, and she has completely and totally grown from her past rather than let it kind of take over. Um, She uses that strength to help the teenagers who are having problems with Freddy Krueger as well. And instead of needing the help, she's giving help. So she already is, you know, subverting that whole women need help all the time kind of trope. Um, Mm -hmm. She's taking everything into her own hands. And she dies. But does she? Because she sacrifices herself to save the kids. But then she's back again. So she still fits the final, final girl. Um, narrative because she's back again in Nightmare on Elm Street 7 in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. My favorite. It's so good in 1994. And actually, I would say that one's even more popular than Dream Warriors. People who don't even like haven't even seen any of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise love New Nightmare, which is pretty cool. I think it's a good movie. Um, So yeah, Nancy's back. But no, she isn't. She's Heather Langenkamp. By the end of the movie, we can say she technically is still Nancy, um, but she's actually playing, the actress Heather is playing herself in this movie. But she's still a final girl, because according to Wes Craven in this movie, Nancy is back. And we find out at the end of the film that this was, this has been turned into a script for Nancy, or as Nancy. It gets kind of confusing by the end, but I would say she still counts as Nancy. Mm -hmm. Because the whole movie mirrors the first movie. The only difference is that 
This time, Heather is a mother and a wife, and she also appears to be suffering from PTSD. Even though she didn't actually go through anything that happened in these movies, she's still having nightmares. She is also getting phone calls from a stalker that's causing her a lot of problems and making these nightmares continue to come up. And again, she doesn't come back messed up. She doesn't come back like with issues. She's just Heather Langenkamp slash Nancy. She's just a mother and a wife. She completely comes full circle. So in the first movie, she totally disagrees with her mother's decision to kill Freddy when she's a child. But as a mother, she, ba- she no, not basically, she does the exact same thing that her mother did to defend her own child. Um, she's a dynamic and flexible character that outlines real life because she completely comes full circle throughout these movies. And in the end of the film, she says, fuck you, and gives Freddy a solid right hook, which was so satisfying, and I loved it. <laughs> and it was actually so empowering. <laughs> it's like, you go, girl. But one of the things that I really love about Nancy as a final girl is that I don't think that she counts as virginal because in the first film, so we never ha- see her have sex, but kind of the feeling that I get from her and Glenn is that they're not trying to have sex for the first time. That's just the feeling that I get from their relationship, that she's not a virgin, but it's never mentioned completely. So this is just my own perception of it. So I don't think Nancy counts as being virginal. And so that means that innocence doesn't necessarily mean virginity. She definitely isn't a virgin in the final film because she has a child. So, but he's still going after her anyways. He's going after her and her son. So one of the things with the the virginal thing is that um, she makes it clear in in Men, Women, and Chainsaws that Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that the character has to be a virgin, Mm -hmm. but she's virginal throughout the movie. So she's not, so, I mean, for example, I can't remember Nancy's friend's name. I think it's Tina. So she's having sex, and guess what happens to her? Yeah. Whereas Nancy, Glenn is kind of trying to, like, make a move, and she's like, not now, we're supposed to be here for Tina. And she just, like, totally cock blocks him and shuts him down. And so that would still be perceived as virginal, because she's not having sex. Throughout, that's how that's how Carol Clover would or does. I think I think Nancy's in the book. That's how she um, characterizes it: is that she's not actually having sex in the movie, so it still counts. For, okay. Virginity is a bullshit contrived concept anyway, so it's like yeah. you really have to take well, her definition of it because it's like this already isn't clear. It's like. Well, if she's making well, exactly. out with her boyfriend, I mean, she's not having sex, so she should be say, or, you know, and it's like, well, how far? And then mm-hmm. you get into the conversation of like, well, how far does it have to go before she's not a virgin anymore? And that kind of is fucking Well, and stupid. exactly, and that's, <laughs> that gets more to, that gets back to the original point of, but what does a virginal character signify to a man watching mm-hmm. this movie? Someone who's innocent, someone who needs protecting, someone who you can root for because she's, you know, the damsel in distress kind of. And and yeah, she's, yeah. oh my God, she's overcoming the fact that she's this weak, virginal woman and she's fighting back. And that's where, it, I mean, again, because that's, that's who they're really trying to appeal to with the final girl. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it is empowering for women. But that I don't think that was ever their intention. Their intention was, we have to find a way for men to engage with this character. Mm-hmm. Because God forbid that men should have to engage with a female character just because she's, like, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> instead, it's, you know, and you see this a lot in, like, for example, a few years ago, a new Tomb Raider game came out. And I guess there was a scene, I don't know if it made it into the final game, But there was a scene where Lara Croft was gang raped or about to be gang raped and escaped. Oh my God. And the the people who made the game, there was this huge backlash because their justification for including that scene was that men playing the game had to have a reason to want to protect and make sure that Lara survived. So what better way than to have her be 
like brutalized on screen and then they can feel bad for her. Wow. So <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of <clears throat> You guys should really read Men, Women, and Chainsaws. It's yeah. so good. Oh, I have to. She explains it so much better than the way I'm explaining yeah. it. But I'm probably going to order it. I have to read it soon. Yeah, it's, right it's good. Mm-hmm. You can get it from the bookstore. That's right. Get it I from the book it. rack. I got it. I have it, but I have to read it before I start writing my thesis because my thesis is going to include a lot of... Probably quoting her a lot. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> so. It's good. It's good. And so, so the, again, that's that's kind of her main point in that book is... You have these female characters who we find empowering, Mm -hmm. but the intention behind them was to make men invest in them. Yeah. And feel bad for them and hope that they, and hope that they survive because I guess you can't just hope somebody survives a serial killer without like having a reason. I have to, I have to manipulate (laughs) you into empathy. Like, (laughs) that's sad. (laughs) Basically, yeah. So sad. I just want. I just want like God. a movie where the woman is like sleeps with five different guys, is probably overweight, isn't really pretty, <laughs> like conventionally pretty, and she still survives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you seen Black the original Black Christmas? Mm mm. Nope. Okay, so she. I mean, she is really beautiful, of course, but. She's actually pregnant and in the middle of fighting with her boyfriend because he she wants to get an abortion. And he's like, no, you can't. And she's like, fuck you, I don't care. And she's the final girl in that movie. Awesome. Like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, actually, that's on Hulu if you guys have Hulu Plus. Black Christmas is on there. Yeah, I just I just want to see more movies where like, and I know Hollywood tries to make everything super presentable, presentable, but I like want to see a girl who forgot to shave her legs and you know, mm-hmm. like has yeah. stretch marks and you know, because it's more relatable. Like I'm looking at these women yeah. and they're also badass, but they're still some of them, even the modern horror movies and movies in general, like they're still not relatable because I'm like, no way. No way do you mm-hmm. look like that. No way do you not have days where you wake up and you just, yeah. your hair is sticking straight up and, like, your breath smells, like, really terrible. And, <laughs> you know, and I don't know. Maybe they'll work on that. Maybe they won't. I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine because I was talking about how frustrating it is. Like, how in everything that we watch and read, if there is a female lead, she has to have a love interest every time Mm -hmm. and it drives me nuts it's like even in movies where it isn't even necessary it's like they still have to add a a male lead that's a love interest because apparently she doesn't matter unless there's a man in her life or something yeah it just drives me nuts it's like that's actually when i rated the handmaid's tale on goodreads i gave it a four because she had a love interest (laughs) Because that I felt like that love interest came out of nowhere, and I felt like it was completely and totally unnecessary. And I didn't feel like it fit her character. It might have been about her, like, child and everything, that she was more concerned about, like, Hannah. And, you know, like, she thought about her husband, but Hannah was, like, I think since the whole thing was about, well, partially about fertility and everything, and that she had a child that was taken away from her. Mm-hmm. I, I think that might have been the, the reason that Margaret Atwood did that. Because I think Margaret Atwood's a person who's very aware of all of those tro- tropey things that, like, a woman has mm-hmm. to be this for people to care about her. Like, she doesn't give a shit. She tells it like it is. So, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I just I just felt like her character was just so much better because I, I felt like she was so empowering and then she got like a a boyfriend and I was like oh wait are you talking about Luke oh I was thinking I was thinking about like her because in the sh- in the show spoiler alert she gets with Luke like for practical purposes of having a child and she ends up kind of ending up having feelings for him which yeah I didn't think that was necessary ends up with Wait, Luke? Luke's her husband. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not Luke. Nick. The chauffeur. Nick. Yeah, no, that's who I'm talking about. I get that, but then she, like, but in the the book, I I don't know. It just, it just, it developed into a relationship that I just didn't 
feel was necessary. And I guess as somebody who's so used to being single, I just want to be able to read a book or watch a movie about an empowering woman. Right. Who's single. Who doesn't get in a relationship. Like, because it's starting to feel like women aren't, like, fulfilled without a man in her life. And it's really starting to frustrate me. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen the movie The Heat? Oh, wait. Is that the one with... with uh? It's well, it's a comedy. It's, yeah, it's got Sandra Bullock in it, doesn't it? Yeah, Melissa McCarthy yeah. and Sandra Bullock. I There's no it. romance. Yeah, in that movie, and I loved it. Yeah, yeah. yeah that they was, didn't that need a. Funny. They didn't need a man. No, they didn't. They really did not. Yeah, no. I just. It's not. It's not like a thing where it's just. A, I. I hate all romance. It's no. just goddamn. No, like, I understand give now. Me well, one exactly. Character that I can relate to, like just one. <laughs> no, I totally understand <laughs> you know? that now. I thought you were talking about like her former husband and stuff. And it, no, no, I understand that. And they made it even more romance in the show. My only thing with that was yeah. like I. I felt for her going like okay. You obviously empathize with me. So now what, what are you going to do about it? Like you have power mm-hmm. as a man to ha- kind of sort of help me or at least be an ally. Yeah. But you're not going to do fuck all because you're a puss. I totally understand where you're coming from with that. I think I had just a little bit more of my notes. I don't know. Okay. Oh, I just had like one little thing left to say. So I was just going to say. Um, throughout those three films, Nancy kind of represents three female roles that society and movies often just shit on. And the first one is the teenage girl. The second is a single woman in her 20s or 30s. And the last one is a mother, because half the time you see moms in movies who apparently can't do anything, even though moms are total badasses. But she kind of flips all of those roles on their heads and proves it doesn't really matter who the hell you are. You can kick evil's ass any day. And and Nancy kind of turns it into a coming of age story because it's like a, you know, it's like a circle. It all comes back to the beginning. (laughs) But no, those are all good points. That's my pick. I I love the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. I can't wait for us to do our episode because there is so much to talk about. <laughs> did you did you ever I know we talked about this once before, but did you ever watch Never Sleep Again? No. No, I was watch gonna it. try to watch it today and I didn't have time. It's like four hours. Oh dear God. Okay. Like I had to watch it in like two sittings because eventually mm-hmm. it just becomes like overwhelming and it's like, oh I have to sure, take a break. Sure. I have to take a break. Yeah. But yeah. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It's a really good documentary yeah, do with no Johnny Depp in it. <laughs> what the hell? He did talk about it when he was on Inside the Actors Studio, so it's not like he won't talk about it. Well, it was his first, I think it was his first movie. It was, and that's what he said. Heather talked about giving him pointers. Okay, thanks you, uh, thanks you for listening, guys. <laughs> I've been in paper, workshop, paper writing workshops for like three days in a row. So I don't know English anymore. Thanks you so much. And we'll see you next week.